Let's try this again with feeling this. Somebody time. says to take three. <laughs> Thanks, Miles. We're in. So. All right, cool. Cool, cool. All right, here we cool, go. Cool, cool, Starting cool, cool, the cool, cool, recording. Cool. Three, two, one. Hello and welcome from the. From Dufflin to Cleveland. What they were showing us? Logan Howard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, what a great hot start. Uh, um, I am your host, Logan Howard, from Dublin to Cleveland. Is the show. You are listening to, and I am joined, of course, by my one and only true friend, and uh, uh, Brendan Thomas Merritt. <laughs> How are you, Brendan? <laughs> well, this is our third take for the intro, and I'm still smiling, so <laughs> no point stopping now. <laughs> Lots of editing. Lots, Lots of, of editing. editing. 30 minutes of footage no one will ever see. Anyway, um, <laughs> what we're going to do... Nope, nope, nobody's ever seen this. <laughs> anyway, what we're doing today is we are going to uh, play a game. We're going to play a game that is for a minute. So each of us are going to have a topic where we're going to talk about something. Uh, we're going to have some questions. We're going to go over them. Um, so... Um, I'm going to ask the first question of Brendan, and I'll let him have a minute to respond to it. So, Brendan, is beauty more important than brains? Go. Undoubtedly. If you are a super special, awesome, intelligent, clever tech whiz, but you've got a face that only a mother could love, like we're talking like a real face like a dog, you're going to end up better and alone at the end of the day anyway. You know, true happiness and fulfillment comes from familial relationships, friend relationships, and relationships with God. And if all you have is your intelligence and the money that you may possibly make from that, um, you are actually not guaranteed to live a happy, healthy, successful life. Whereas if you have no wits about you at all, but you do have beauty, you will probably have rich guys bending over backwards to scoop you up so they can put their arm around your shoulder and put a ring on your finger. And then um, they will look after you, they will lavish you, they will prosper you, they will take care of you. And you might be as dumb as a jar of sand, but you will still have a roof over your head, food on your belly, and all the good stuff to come with having bagged a rich man. And that's how Brendan sees it. Amen. <laughs> and time. All right. Um, so, my go. Let's see. So, um, I would say I agree with that when it comes to guys. All right, guys, uh, if you're uglier than a dump truck, yeah, nobody's nobody's going for that. You know, you could be smart. You could have a really great personality. Nobody's going for your smartness. Now, girls, girls, all of them are beautiful. You know, you very, you rarely, rarely, very rarely find ones that are not good looking, uh, at least to some degree. So, you know, all of, all, of, so for them, it, it, it's, uh, brains are a bonus. They, they start with beauty to begin with. All right. So guys, on the other hand, yeah, they're, they're screwed. Like, if you look like a dump truck, no one, no one's hanging out with that. It, it's just, it's just that way. As somebody who is more brains than beauty, it, I, I completely understand this, this phrase, so. <laughs> but, uh, that's my opinion, so that's how Logan, uh, Logan learns it, you know, let's go with that. <laughs> um, now, on to our next question. Parenting leave for men should be the norm. Go. Um, it's... 
it should be the norm. I think it's a really good thing. I think it's really helpful for young families um, to, especially the first time you have kids. I can see how it would be misused and abused um, in them not using it for its intended purposes or just continuing to have kids so you can keep taking the leave off, um, which is not a good reason to have kids. <laughs> but I think it's a good thing. Um, I think more importantly, it's it's important important for dads to be present in their kids' lives when they're a little older, um, especially after like five or six years old. When they're little, they kind of need their moms. So uh, paternity leave is a really cool, awesome, important thing because they need their moms to take care of them. And so I think it's helpful for like two weeks to to have a dad so you can get used to a routine of having a baby. Um, but other than that, it, it's uh, I would say it's a good thing. So there's my time. Uh, Brendan. How do you feel? Go. Yeah, I am, as a man, and a capitalist, I like money, and I would like to get money for, you know, not doing anything. Uh, as I said, the capitalist within me is like, hush, selfish child, think this through properly. So uh, I'm all for women having, you know, extended leave from work, you know, they're benefiting society as a whole. It's, it's all great, it's all great. Um, whereas for two parent families, no, I think a man might possibly, you know, should be entitled to maybe two weeks of parental leave or so, you know, uh, to get his house in order, help out his wife get to know the baby. But, um, I mean, you could have a situation where you've got husband and wife who both work the same company, both of them taking, let's say a year off and both getting paid for a whole year for doing nothing. Um, for the benefit of the company? No, absolutely not. So, um, for one parent, yes. And then the one who either not have the baby or is not committed to looking after the baby full-time, <clears throat> maybe only two weeks. And if it's a case where, let's say, the woman wants to go back to work, well, then it could be inverted. Good time. Uh, so, uh, my question now... Um, what is the best Star Wars character? And go. This is a tough one, because I know that a lot of people kind of like Yoda, but, uh, I don't know, I can't get over Yoda in The Empire Strikes Back. He is a mentor. Um, Obi-Wan is probably my favorite of the Jedi. I got his lightsaber at the same time Revenge of the Sith came out. And uh, it's blue, and blue is a favorite color. I love blue. So I think he's pretty awesome. But, I'm sorry, between bringing Luke to Tatooine and rescuing Luke from some people, he didn't do a heck of a lot. That little scene in Rebels did squat for me. Um, whereas I actually think Ahsoka is probably the best written of them all. Because when you first meet her, she is such a snot no little brat that you just want to wipe the floor with her. Um, but you gradually see her grow in knowledge maturity. You know, she leads clones in an attack and gets them all killed for her arrogance. And she has to forgive herself for that. She has to come under the authority of the Jedi, um, who ultimately betray her in a, in a great sabotage plan by, by the darkness that's rising. And ultimately, by the last four episodes, which are sublime, and which absolutely needs to be put in a movie and I uh, cut in with the other scenes from the movie and um, she ultimately forgives them and uh, yeah. and takes on Darth Maul all by herself survives and wins so uh, I think Ahsoka's ultimate character arc is probably the best I would say I would say uh, I, I like I, I agree with Brendan Obi-Wan's my favourite um but I think the best story or the best character is Vader because you see he's the he's the main arc of the whole story. It starts with him as a little kid and how he grows from um, being a, a snot-nosed kid to being a snot-nosed uh, Jedi to being um, a really good Jedi to being completely misled and guided along by this evil mentor to the point where he turns on everything that he knows and cares and loves all in an effort to save somebody he loves and then he goes down the wrong path loses the person he loves ends up 
being evil and fighting for the wrong thing until his son comes along and redeems him from from that. So that to me is is the best character story arc story in the whole uh, trilogy slash uh, double trilogy that is the Star Wars universe. So, uh, Brendan, over to you for the next question. Sure. Three strike laws are useful for reducing the number of serious offenses. <laughs> Given that your country's on fire as we speak, go. <laughs> Alright, so three <laughs> three strike offenses. So basically I can do two two bad things and no one's ever gonna give me an issue. Like that that's the problem that I have with it, is mm. that uh, it gives people liberties to get away with things. Um, if you all that's the thing with uh, with baseball and with other things. If you if you really want them to do it one time, you don't want them to do bad things. You don't say, oh, you got three strikes, so, oh, that's strike number strike number two. Because pe most people will take advantage of that. Um, there's a quote I heard the other day that uh, people are, are, a person is smart and people are dumb. Uh, basically, when people see that you can get away with two things, they're going to take advantage of that. Mm. <laughs> um, so that, that's my opinion, is it's not a good idea because people will just adva take advantage of the system and then they'll be like, oh, this is my third strike, I probably shouldn't do anything else now. Whereas they got away with two bad things. So that that's me. How about you, Brendan? What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, you know what, there are times that you might have a juvenile commit a crime and maybe the manager decides to deal with it in-house. You know, give him a slap around the wrist, tell him to cop himself on and get his act together. Fair enough, that's an act of grace. Um, those aside, you don't wake up one yeah. day and forget that looting, arson, rape, murder, and violence are illegal. If you do them, it's kind of because you've chosen to. And um, why would you incentivize that repeated behaviour? The only reason you would is because you believe that violence, criminality, murder, all, all those um, are actually for the benefit of society because anarchy is your heart's desire. All right. Um, so the next question um, is, are books better than movies? Brendan, what do you feel? <laughs> I absolutely think that books are better than movies, and not only because I'm in the process of writing my own shameless self-advertisement. <laughs> um, but you know, when you've written a book, um, you're literally giving someone the option of seeing into your soul, um, to see your perspective on the world, see a little taste, a little flavour of your experience of this crazy thing we're all going through called life. Um, and you get to engage with the characters on a deeper level because you don't just see what they do and hear what they say, but you can also understand their heart and their minds. Whereas I think for movies, um, very often the personal engagement is gone. And it's mainly about, you know, what's going to be dramatic enough to hold your attention. Um, or especially nowadays, you know, um, what can be written slowly enough <laughs> that, you know, you must absolutely make a part two and a sequel and all this kind of crack. So um, I think books are just so much more personal. Um, there's a reason they stood the test of time. And they are one of, if not our oldest methods of understanding and challenging the world that we live in. Where I think a lot of movies are just more, um, more shallow. Yeah. What do you think? Um, so, I mean, I think when movies made first, for mm. movies over books. When the book is made first, I prefer books over movies. Mm. And that comes down to how it was, how it was written and what the story, like, how you picture the story. Um, one of the amazing cool things about books is that you can imagine the world mm. they paint a really good picture most of most authors do painting a really good picture of a story but in the in reality you build the idea of what they look like and how they're acting and the things they're going through is all in your brain 
Whereas mm. with movies, and it's it's different. It's not necessarily worse, but it is different in that you see everything, and you don't necessarily um, you don't necessarily build an imagination about these people because you see mm. what they look like, mm. uh, which can be good and bad on different things. But I do think uh, books are better because they give you they lend to your imagination and help you uh, help you learn and think about things. So uh, that's my thoughts. Uh, Brendan, how about the next question? Um, oh, this is going to be a fun one. <laughs> <laughs> Genetically engineered humans is an issue of time. <sighs> okay. Um, so, I feel like, in a way, we already do genetically mm. engineered humans. In a way, people like to use, like... Uh, sperm cell donations and like they try to create the perfect baby because if you want green eyes this is the this is what you do and if you want certain hair and so in a way we do have that and I'm not mm. sure that that's that's a good way to do things but, mm. you know biblically God creates God does it like we don't mm. we shouldn't have like customization to customize our babies like we can yeah. say in video games or um you know, we we live in the society of customization. You can customize anything you want. T-shirts, games, whatever. You can customize it to what you want. And I don't think having a kid or genetically engineering humans is the right way to go about it. So it's probably something we'll deal with, but it's probably not something that um, is a good thing. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, you know, in the day of the Tower of Babel, um, you know, the Lord said... That people, if left to own devices, can do anything. And that's the reason that he personally saw to it that their use of language was confounded. Um, but again, he is the creator. We are not. And, you know, we can even see in Genesis 6 an attempt to genetically engineer a species of people. They're called the Nephilim. And <laughs> God was so unhappy with it that he sent the great blood to wipe them out. Now, I know that probably a couple survived maybe on the ark, or else they were created later as well. But, you know, we see them all throughout the Old Testament. But um, they were abominations in the eyes of God. He absolutely despised it. And so, I think for ourselves, we need to be very careful as a generation um, that we don't overstep. That there are certain things we leave in God's hands. So, new question time. It, it is, what is the real football? Is it <laughs> uh, the game that America's known as soccer? Or is it the game that Americans <laughs> actually call football? Uh, and it's the floor is yours, Brendan. <laughs> it is neither. It's Gaelic football. Which is Irish football. <laughs> which is a beautiful sport in which you can hold the ball, run two or three steps, then kick the ball. It's got this perfect blend between American football with the holding and British soccer with the kicking. Why not just put them together and play them on the Emerald Isle? A place where the grass is always green. It rains so often <clears throat> that no one can tell if you're just excessively sweating. We've got, you know, a mild climate, so it's not like the ball is ever going to melt. So all you British and Americans fighting your eternal war, I'm sorry, but listen, your revolution ended a few hundred years ago. The Irish revolution is nigh. Hashtag Gaelic football. <laughs> but go on, tell us why American Elite is in the way. Alright, so American football is better than English football because it's not boring. If you sit there and watch a soccer game, you will bore your own mind out. And then, and then at the 93rd minute in overtime, you might get a goal and go, wow, that was pretty cool. But, whereas in football, there's always something fun happening. There's guys flying all over the place, there's tackling, there's a ball in a beautifully thrown way. It's just amazing to watch. Um, it's also 
more aggravating than soccer because soccer is boring, like I said before. So as you're watching a game, if the game isn't going well, it's much more aggravating than when you're watching a soccer game and you're like, oh, somebody scored. That's really cool for the five seconds. And then now we wait for them to try and score again. And they're just passing back and forth, back and forth. Um, so that's why American football is better. <laughs> Uh, okay, next one. <clears throat> Could the global <laughs> spread of cryptocurrency undermine the existing political systems? All right. So this might be a topic that both of us disagree on. Um, I am not a a crypto person. Um, I feel like I don't think it undermines political systems. I just don't trust something that I can't always physically know is an amount that's there. Um, I mean, it probably does in, in reality turn out to be sort of like an epic card, but at the same time, it feels like, you know, one of those end time things where if everyone's on cryptocurrency, the, they can easily put a chip in your arm or something along those lines to make you, uh, that's the way your money, um, so does it undermine political systems? I don't really care. I'm not really here for the political systems. I'm here be, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. So, um, but to me, I'm not a huge. I'm not one who's going to invest in cryptocurrency because I don't know if it has the the legs or the trust that humans will need to put into it. So that that's my opinion. Uh, Brendan, please. Uh, Please tell you why you're uh, wrong. Inform us as to why I'm very wrong. <laughs> well, since Logan did the typical Baptist thing of falling back on the Book of Revelation and the end times as soon as he encountered with something that he didn't understand, <laughs> yes, it does upend and undermine political <laughs> systems. Because if I'm going off this earth, I'm going to bankrupt the Antichrist regime before I do. <laughs> Boy, the mind, the beast, the microchips will come to think. <laughs> I think it does undermine political systems, but perhaps not in the way people think. A lot of politicians are very good at regulating taxes um, around deals, strategies, and programs that they have already decided that they're going to usher in. Um, and the whole thing with Governments giving money towards things is nonsense. It's all just taxpayer money. Um, and they can very easily regulate and devalue a currency based on what their own long-term agendas are. Whereas I think with cryptocurrency, um, it's giving you kind of that taste of dabbling in the market. But because of the system that it is, the government cannot actually get their hands on it. Uh, in terms of its its value, it's something that's out of their reach. It's probably what drives them crazy, and that the reason that so many of them constantly come against it and speak, about, speak badly about it to disincentivize its usage. But I think people are actually undermining wicked, greedy governments when they have their money invested in these kind of things that the government cannot strategically manipulate like they can with other stocks. Uh, so, next question is, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Please, Brendan, inform us of the correct answer. Well, that is very, very easy, <laughs> because the book of Genesis never says that God made eggs. <laughs> it says that he created the animals. You know, he created those with wings, those who fly, those that are in the water, those that are on land people, marriage, um, but uh, never said that he made eggs. So uh, he undoubtedly created um, animals either in, if not in a mature state, at least in a state of, you know, prepubescence. Um, and then they quickly began popping eggs themselves. Apart from Cadbury's chocolate eggs. They've always been there. All right. Very succinct. And <laughs> Very succinct and simple answer. Yes. Yeah. Um, Don't do double cross so, my Genesis. Oh no. 
<laughs> I, I like uh, that. So I agree completely. I, I complete I completely agree with him. I will say that for the a for the uh, the chicken that just hatched the other day, I think the egg did come first in that situation where the egg did come before it. But it, it is uh, it's a cycle thing. Um, <laughs> at some point, there did have to be a first chicken rather than a first egg. Um, <laughs> and I think I think Brendan is you do need. Uh, God would have created, if not a mature, um, a mature chicken. He would have at least uh, one growing or a little chick that grew up, um, and then was able to lay eggs and such. So, yeah, I pretty sure the chicken came first. <laughs> Imagine watching the very first um, chicken so, laying uh, the very Brandon, first egg. Our, <laughs> our final uh, minute question. I'm sure I was so confused. Like, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> I'm dying! Oh, no ways. That felt strangely peaceful. <laughs> Uncomfortable. Alright, guys. So, for today's Bible passage, we're going to look at a survey of the race of Edomites. Who are the Edomites, I hear you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. All the way back in Genesis, we meet twin brothers, Esau and Jacob. Esau was the hairy brother. He was very, very strong, very masculine. He liked hunting and, you know, walking out into the wild, all of his lonesome and killing animals here, there, and everywhere. And, you know, cutting off their fur and eating their flesh from the bones. <laughs> Raw! Maybe that's my, my my own edition. Jacob was the quieter brother. He liked just sitting at home or in the tents. He was probably a bit of a mama's boy, even though he's in his 40s. Um, Esau was the oldest of the twins, so he was supposed to get the birthright, the inheritance, the blessing, um, the nation of Israel, basically, and the legacy that had been first spoken to Abraham. And then to Abraham's son Isaac. However, through a couple incidents of deception, trickery, and just pure and utter nonsense, um, Jacob ended up pinching them all from Esau. Esau was like, I'm gonna kill you dead. So Jacob ran away. Esau had a nickname Edom, which means red. Jacob was later given a new name, which means, um, the new name Israel. After decades, the two brothers finally came back together. Jacob was absolutely bricking it, but Esau just gave a big hug and a kiss, and was like, I've missed you, Budu, you're so wonderful, I love you so much. Um, but that message didn't really seem to be transmitted to their descendants. After the Israelites got out of Egypt, they tried to take a shortcut through the Edomites' terrain. And the Edomites said, No way, Jose, who do you think you are? Good one. Now, Deuteronomy tells us that the Israelites actually went through Edom, so presumably the fear of God fell on the holder and a lot of them, and they kind of got their act together. Um, and then Moses went up Mount Sinai, where he met the Lord. And the Lord told him um, to allow for gradual citizenship of the Edomites when the Israelites had re-entered the Promised Land because they were brother nations. Yet we read in the book of Psalms that when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon invaded Israel and had set fire to the temple of God the Solomon had built, the Edomites were dancing around, saying, Burn it down! Burn it to the ground! These people were brother nations, yet they looked on with wry pleasure and relish as the temple of God, a building unlike any before or since, was turned into molten and utterly stripped of all of its jewels, all of its wealth, all of its precious stone, and, and ransacked and turned to ash. We last meet the Edomites 
in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. By which time a politician became a, had become a counterfeit king, or a puppet king. And his name was Herod the Great, or Herod the Edomite. Thousands of years had passed since Jacob had stolen the birthright and the right to the land from his brother Esau, or Edom. And finally, after millennia, King Herod the Edomite had finally gotten the land. And no sooner had he sat on that throne, the next thing, wise men came and said, The King of the Jews has been born! The King of Israel has been born! And we're off to see him. Didn't make a heck of a lot of sense to Herod, so he consulted his magicians and his scribes. And they whipped out the Old Testament prophecies that said that through Jacob's descendants, the king of Israel would come. And for that reason, Herod, much like the Antichrist, um, who Daniel tells us believes he can prevent his end from coming, Herod set himself up as such a proud, arrogant, conceited king that he thought he could stop prophecy from taking place. And he decided to kill every boy two years old and under. But as we know, the Lord spoke to Joseph in dreams and they were able to escape to Egypt as refugees and ultimately prolong Jesus' life. But what I really see in this story is the root of bitterness. It starts all the way in Genesis, halfway through the very first book and trickled down through millennia until finally it had massacred an entire generation of baby boys. Just heinous. But we as God's kids have to be so, so careful that if there are seeds of bitterness in us, we might not go around killing babies, but it might stop us from sharing the gospel. And we may not be actively killing people, but we certainly aren't doing anything to reconcile them to God through Jesus Christ. So we have to be so, so careful to do regular heart checks. And if those seeds of bitterness are in us, to do something about it. You put your spiritual gardening gloves on, you pull up those suckers, and you chuck them out. Because they are not your portion. Uh, what do you think, Logan? Well, um, I thought you did a really good job laying that out. Um, one of the things I think of, and this might be the root of the bitterness mm. that comes from them, is they felt they deserved the birthright. They deserved God's love and care wow. on them because they were the oldest brother. Mm. So Esau was the oldest. And to Esau, he deserved the blessing. He deserved to be the one who would carry the family into the future. And God said, no, I'm taking Jacob. Jacob is my one who I love. Jacob's the one who I care for. Uh, as the verse says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Um, and so God chose Jacob. And to this, to, through the whole book of the Bible, you see the Edomites having a problem with that. Mm -hmm. That they couldn't handle the fact that God had given something to their little brother that they thought was theirs. Um, and, I mean, you end up in books like Obadiah that have the prophecy about God is going to take out Edom because of the way they responded. They respond in a really bad attitude. They say and they're they they think they're good, but he God says, I'm gonna make you a small nation. You shall be greatly despised. Um, and because, why am I doing this? Because of the violence you had against your brother Jacob. Shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. Like I'm gonna take you out because you can't handle it and you've continued to be bitter towards your brother. Um, and it says here in verse eighteen of Obadiah that no survivors are going to remain of the house of Esau. As you continue on through the line, you see that uh, you have Herod who dies from having worms eat him, um, and you don't hear from Edomites after that. Um, it God, God takes there's no there's nobody left. Um, and why is that the case? Why does he do this? because of their hearts. Their hearts were absolutely against God. We easily get to the same situation. We can look and let's let's just say it's just me and Brendan, and God has blessed Brendan with gifts that are different than mine. Mm. And if I'm bitter about that, if I think that I need gifts that Brendan has that 
I should have those things, I could easily build a bitter heart towards him and towards God because of mm-hmm. what God did in Brendan's life. Um, and we as Christians shouldn't ever get to that point. It should always be glorifying God for what we see in our in our fellow believers. Um, some of us aren't given to teaching, you know, getting up on stage and leading uh, and preaching. Some of us aren't, aren't gifted that way. We don't have way with words. We're not... Uh, we're not just gifted in that way. We shouldn't then get upset when uh, somebody else gets chosen over us or gets to do those things because God gifted them that way. Um, and God has given us. I think a lot of times we let that inner voice tell us that we're not good at things, that we're not, uh, that God hasn't gifted us with things, or maybe he's only gifted us like that story in the Bible that Jesus talks about, the parable, that one he was given one talent. And we just bury our talent. We hide it underneath the bushel. We don't let it show. We don't use what God has given us for his honor and glory. Um, and well, how does that story end? You wicked, evil servant. I gave you something. You didn't use it. Um, so God has given us each abilities and skills. And I don't know each and every one of you, probably personally, but I do know that God has gifted you in ways and abilities that you don't even know. Um and so don't be jealous or bitter about what Joe Schmo has or his ability to to do, but focus on what God has called you to do and use your ability. Uh, and the more you focus on God and the more you're gracious and loving, the more you can praise others for their abilities and their talents and the more that you can be right before God because bitterness poisons the soul and poisons each and every one of our minds to the point that we can't interact with those people who we've built such bitterness towards. Um, and really, as, as, as the Bible tries to point out, bitterness only hurts us. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt. It, we can hurt others with our words, but in reality, it just poisons ourselves and makes us miserable. Um, so get rid of bitterness today. That's, that needs to go. If it's in your life where you feel bitter towards something or a situation, let it go. Because God is graciously not held anything against you um, in, in dying on his cross he has not got a hold sin against you so you shouldn't hold things against other people um, so as we uh, closed up um, if you want to get in contact with us we would love some of your questions um, you know anything like some of the questions we went over today if you have questions or answers to those we'd love to hear them um, send them to us at from Dublin to Cleveland at gmail.com that's our new email address. We've, we're super happy about that. Um, we heard, we got an amazing message this week um, from somebody, and we're so thankful for doing that. Um, and uh, we, we hope we can hear more from you guys. Uh, uh, and it's one of those things that we don't – we can easily get into our mindset of going, well, we only have so many people who listen to our podcast. But – the fact that we have one person or two people or any amount of people listening to our podcast is a blessing to both of us, and we're so thankful for that. Because really, we just do it for us. <laughs> so <laughs> the fact that you guys enjoy it and get a kick out of it we is just that much more awesome. So, um, Brendan, uh, you want to close us out or say goodbye or prayer or anything you feel like you need to you want to you want to say? Yeah, lovely. Let's I'll pray it first. Father God, I thank you, Lord God, for everyone who's under the sounds of our voices, God. Meet them where they are this day, this week, for the remainder of this year. Search their heart and know them. Know their innermost thoughts. And if there are any seeds of bitterness there whatsoever, Lord, I pray for a healing touch. From you, Jesus. Just one touch, just one word can heal them entirely and restore them completely from the top of their head to the tip of their toes, inside and out, Lord. And Lord God, I pray that again, everyone who's heard any part of this, that you'll just fill them to overflowing with happiness, joy, and the peace that surpasses all understanding. Friends of peace, in your name we pray all these things. Amen, amen, and amen.